Welcome to the consortium's webinar on the global surgery deficit. This is part of an ongoing series of webinars we're holding on big topics in global health. The consortium is a collection of over 135 academic institutions around the world involved in global health across research, education, and service. Today, we have two outstanding leaders in addressing the global surgery deficit, and I'll introduce to you each of them uh, just prior to them speaking. But as we know, the global surgery deficit is one of the most neglected global health challenges in the world, affecting the world's poor primarily, who only access about 3.5% of all the surgeries performed worldwide. To give you an indication of the impact of this, the number of people who die of injuries alone are about 5.7 million people a year, larger than the number of people who die of HIV AIDS, TB, and malaria. These people, primarily in poor countries, would not die, would not suffer the disability and the lifelong uh, pain and suffering they endure if they had access to global surgery. To talk about this today, our first speaker is Dr. Faizan Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah is at Johns Hopkins. He's the Associate Professor of Pediatric Surgery and International Health at Johns Hopkins University. He's the Chair of the Global Surgery Initiative, and he's also the Chair of the G4 Alliance in Global Surgery. And I encourage you to take a look at the G4 Alliance and see what they're doing. Dr. Abdullah will speak first, and it's a real pleasure to have Dr. Abdullah join us today. Faizan, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the table is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Fazan Abdullah, as Keith gracious enough to introduce me. And it's really a privilege for me to address all of you today uh, about the global surgery deficit. <clears throat> I want to thank Keith Martin, um, as well as uh, the Centers for Universities for, and, and Global Health, CUG, uh, for this privilege and opportunity to address you. So I'll begin. I've really been asked to address three things. How big is the global surgery deficit? What needs to be done? and then how you can directly engage to help. Well, first of all, before we can talk about how big the global surgery deficit is, we have to understand what is surgical care. Well, of course, it's classically what we think about. It's about people doing operations. But surgical care is more than that. It actually also encompasses things that would otherwise might be considered non-procedural, such as wound management. It incorporates knowledge and expertise in burn management, in casting, in splinting. Uh, in traumatic injuries. Not every trauma uh, patient requires an operation. It also uh, encompasses critical care. This slide shows you really how we break down uh, many of the surgical and procedural disciplines. As an example, I'm using the United States system here on the left. So we think about general surgeons or vascular surgeons or orthopedic surgeons. The people after medical school, they go to residency training uh, for anywhere from five to seven years to become an expert or four to seven years in these specific disciplines. On the right-hand column, you've got disciplines which are not really considered classically surgical or procedural. However, they all have some procedural elements. Everything from even pediatrics, where they do lumbar punctures, or bone marrow aspirations, or even procedures in infants, uh, where they put chest tubes in, et cetera. And of course, the other disciplines uh, also have some procedural elements. Interestingly, well, when you talk about surgical care at the low middle income country context, all of these all of these disciplines, that differentiation delineation you can see is a bit artificial because many of these procedures are being done by the general practitioner. Important for us as we think about surgical system strengthening to understand this about surgical care. So how big is a surgery uh, global surgery deficit? Well, it's staggering. Uh, we've got uh, 7 billion people in the world. The blue, um, which represents the poorest one-third of the world, classically we cite that they get, instead of getting 33% of procedures, exactly as Dr. Martin mentioned, they get 3.5% of surgical procedures. The number of people dying from surgical conditions, also really staggering. On the left-hand column, exactly as he just mentioned, HIV, malaria, TB, about 3.5 million deaths. And now on the right-hand column, sadly, surgical care, including injuries, is responsible for more than 6 million deaths. So this is really um, 
getting the attention of global policymakers, and hopefully we're going to all organize ourselves and do something about this. I want to thank the Lancet Commission on Global Security for these next few slides. They've done some outstanding work in terms of really quantifying the disease, uh, 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 the global burden of surgical disease, as well as some of the key messages, and really given us a framework for the work that that needs to be happen as we move forward. So five billion, their latest statistics, uh, cannot access safe surgery. Uh, interestingly, they, you can see here, they say that of that same one-third, poorest one-third, of the world's population, 6.3% uh, of uh, uh, receive 6.3% of the worldwide procedures. So the data is a little bit different than that slide I just showed you uh, a couple slides ago, but you can still see the problem is still mammoth. Um, this is where uh, uh, again some more. Uh, I want to thank John Muir for this slide. It basically shows where uh, geographic. Uh, a surgical rate threshold is lower than otherwise should be, and you can see, not surprising, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in the Indian subcontinent, and Central and South America are among the places that the deficit is the greatest. Um, new data from the Lancet Group that 33 million individuals face catastrophic expenditures paying for surgical anesthesia care annually. So again, helps put uh, a magnitude, uh, gives us a magnitude of what the problem is. So let's move on to what needs to be done. Well, um, there's no question about it. There's patients that are numbering in the millions. And what do we want to do? Well, naturally, uh, especially when you talk about surgeons, obstetricians, trauma surgeons, anesthesiologists, we really want to take a clinical approach to it. Uh, we say that we know it takes more surgeons, we know we need to train more people, and we know we need more supplies and facilities. So that's really what we do, and we, uh, whether, again, and myself included, um, as from our, from our efforts at Johns Hopkins, we very much have focused on that component of the health system in terms of surgical system strengthening, in terms of tr knowledge transfer, but really, as you're thinking about the health system, the health system is much more than that, but we just, unfortunately, over the last 30 to 35 years, have just focused on that element and not really the health system. So the health system itself, we all understand, of course, that it requires human resources, surgeons, and surgical providers. In fact, in places that have LMIC contexts, it may be that non-surgeon physicians or non-surgeon healthcare providers might be providing the bulk of surgical care, but that, again, remains to be determined and is really a local decision. We need medicines and supplies, um, of course, the classic things in terms of suture, antibiotics, more complex equipment. Uh, as well uh, is needed uh, in terms of operating room tables, et cetera. So what needs to be done? Well, let me address it broadly first. Well, first of all, we certainly need to prioritize surgical care on the global health agenda because until we start prioritizing it uh, in terms of the larger funders as well as policymakers, it's really not going to happen. And that's something, a realization many of us have come to over many years. Nationally, uh, again, there's not much provision for surgical care uh, within national health systems just because really it's not been promoted in the past. In what, even in the context of universal health care, there's a lot of work been, that's been done in terms of health universal health coverage and augmenting that, but mention of surgical care is rare. Uh, um, and then, of course, we need to train providers at an unprecedented scope and scale of, we also need more operating rooms, more supplies, more data systems to really understand uh, how we can provide safe and essential surgical care. So I love this quote from Nicholas Kristof um, that you don't fundraise for the national highway system by setting up bake sales. And this is really, I think has context for us in the surgery world in, on several levels. Number one, uh, yes, we can't build national level surgical systems. This is something that uh, really has to be prioritized by governments and major health funders, uh, as well as by major agencies, including WHO, UN, World Bank, etc. Um, and I think it's important. It also has a, it resonates in terms of what we've done in terms of surgical system strengthening and important knowledge transfer activities which have taken the form of medical missions, etc., surgical missions. But I think we have to think bigger in terms of the scale. So this is where what Keith mentioned, the Global Alliance for Surgical Obstetric Trauma and Anesthesia Care has come into play. And I apologize, I'm trying to move through a lot of material uh, just to make sure we can share this. So 
Uh, the global health agenda, um, you know, there are several very uh, important highlights. Alma Auto was really the first universal call for uh, health coverage, uh, and surgery was really not in, in a substantial way a part of that discussion. More disappointing was when the Millennium Development Goals were discussed in 2000, really three were health related and surgical care really was not part of the discussion. That's really what's been happening in terms of 2015. Five years ago, the process for the Sustainable Development Goals uh, really began. And um, yes, over the last one to two years, a group of organizations have started to promote surgical care. Uh, but really, by and large, surgical care has really not been part of that discussion. So as I mentioned, about 30 organizations uh, approximately a year and a half to two years ago began working together to try and promote surgical care on the global health agenda. And I want to thank Kathleen Casey for this slide. Um, really, there was, uh, you know, we, when we, not just we, myself, but we as the organizations that were working together, we recognized that in order for us to really <coughs> achieve the large-scale change that we're, we're thinking about, we have to have a framework and a context. And this is one excellent slide. It's not the only uh, slide we've used as a reference. I'd like to share this one. Well, number one, we certainly have to have a common agenda uh, and shared vision for change um, as we think about strengthening surgical services. We need to have shared measurement uh, in terms of collecting data, focusing on uh, accountability as well. And that's where country-level goals, targets, and metrics uh, will come into play um, as well. Mutually reinforcing activities, even though organizations all have their own specific expertise, we do need to think about what it is that we can work on together. Constant communication, naturally, that's very important, uh, particularly uh, in when we're doing something on a global scale. And then naturally, we need to have backbone support in terms of full-time staff um, that will be helping <coughs> organizations coordinate uh, in terms of uh, strengthening surgical care as a priority item on the global health agenda. Um, and it's interesting, when you look at where we are at today in terms of surgical care versus where, uh, for example, the vaccine community was in the past, we're actually not terribly different. Um, and uh, this slide talks about, you can see that the patient numbers are vast. Uh, the treatments um, in terms of what's needed for the provision of essential surgical care, they exist, but they're really, uh, as we can see from the data, they exist uh, and are accessible only to a few. The costs of surgical care, whether they're perceived or actual, are great. Uh, people view surgical care, at, um, we have clearly a perception problem where we think about surgical care, we think about fancy operating rooms and, and got bypass machines, et cetera. Uh, and then the conventional wisdom has been that, you know what, when you're facing these, this type of a situation, action is really not feasible. And really, the alliance organizations that were working together, they really looked at other uh, global health communities and examples, and I'll just cite one or two quickly because I think there's some important messages, and I would encourage those participants to go back and look at this uh, and look at the slide deck later. There'll be a lot of information that you can pull off of this. So the NCD Alliance, well, was also facing a very similar situation where uh, uh, basically in terms of diabetes, cancer control, cardiac disease, and lung disease, it was really not being prioritized. And the NCD Alliance came together with those three, then four organizations, and they really made it their objective to change the situation. 2,000 organizations in 170 countries came together, and really from uh, countries not having any NCD strategy, now, um, um, you know, just in six years, 92% of countries have a national plan or, or policy for NCDs, and they have a roadmap for activities uh, until 2020. And really, they incorporate NCDs and they have a voice. And it's not just the central NCD alliance, it's the member organizations that through that NCD platform and the alliance platform, they represent uh, themselves as an alliance, as individual organizations at every major international, regional, national conversation uh, as it relates to NCDs. Um, and they've, again, produced some of the latest policy work. They've convened expert working groups. And they've really pressed governments and help, try to hold them accountable in terms of uh, having NCDs as a global development priority. Um, Gavi is another great example. There's elements there that are very applicable to the surgical world. Um, Gavi um, is credited um, really with uh, preventing more than 7 million deaths from hepatitis, meningitis, um, and other diseases. It focuses primarily on children. And the target audience for Gavi has been UN agencies, governments, and the private sector. 
and this is some of the timeline. Again, I would urge you to go back and look at that. But they've been credited with develop, uh, delivering 440 million vaccines, uh, six million, six to seven million ch children saved, and um, they really garnered support at the billion, uh, multi-billion dollar level. But the interesting thing about Gavi, and I think that has very direct um, lessons for the surgical community, is that they really aggregated demand, and by coordinating demand, they've been able to provide um, uh, basically industry a uh, you know future projections and a regulated, steady demand, which is, allows them in terms of production to be um, you know to be predictable. They've encouraged competition. They've actually encouraged. Uh, specific vaccine makers who otherwise weren't in the market to come into the market. They have a transparency, that a high level of transparency. They publish vaccines, uh, prices, etc. There's tiered pricing, so for countries that can't afford pricing at a lower level, um, you can then, after you your economic growth hits a certain level, you can graduate out of the tiered pricing. And then there's sustainable pricing for graduating countries. So again, uh, Lots of lessons in terms of the expensive surgical care that might be provided. So, what did the alliance? What is the alliance, uh, and what has it done, and, and what is it trying to do? Well, certainly the major focal point around around the Global Alliance for Surgical Obstetric Trauma and Anesthesia Care, also known as the G4 Alliance, is to advocate for the neglected surgical patient, and it's really about uh, providing a platform for supporting increased access uh, to safe, essential, timely surgical obstetric trauma and anesthesia care. Well, why four disciplines? I, you saw that uh, slide from me in the past where really at the first referral facility level, um, we can't break down traditional disciplines. Many times it's one individual practitioner and we wanted to make sure that these efforts and surgical system strengthening efforts were focused around uh, that same person. Um, as these organizations worked on developing a platform, certainly we want, they wanted it to be open, inclusive, transparent. They wanted balanced global representation, equitable governance, a sustainable financial model, uh, strict fiscal policies because if you look at other global health movements, some have failed because uh, of poor fiscal policies. And the alliance really in terms of its initial objective is designed to influence policymakers, funders, and the public. And of course dedicated full-time staff. What the alliance is not, this is important because people get confused, the alliance is not an individual, it's not a university, it's not an NGO, it's not a specific country affiliated effort. And it's not about generating research or quantifying the burden of surgical disease, which is incredibly important. So for example, DCP3, Lancet Commission of Global Surgery, uh, they each have their incredible respective and important roles, but the alliance is, is and is directly coordinating with both of those entities to make sure that there's no overlap uh, in terms of work that's being done. And that's why, for example, two of the three uh, Lancet Commission chairs are part of the alliance. Now, this, And I want to thank the G4 full-time staff for these slides. Again, I put them in there so they can be referred to later. In terms of the positioning and the reference market of, of the G4 alliance, there's been a lot of work that's been done in terms of the comparative uh, positioning of the alliance in the global matrix of nonprofits. A lot of this work has been done, and also in terms of making sure that uh, the, the messages of the alliance and the key drivers and motivations in terms of resonating with the right constituencies, that also has been done. A uh, 360 degree communication strategy has been developed for the alliance, which again, they've been doing a great job in, in, in terms of executing, in terms of using not only uh, social media, but videos, etc. So I'd encourage you to go to the G4 Alliance website and check it out. Uh, again, getting back to the governance, so what's this going to look like? It's an inclusive, balanced uh, organization that advocates for surgical care. Um, and, and here's some of the elements. The Permanent Council is really a one organization, one vote structure. And the Honorary Council almost functions, since I'm speaking in the U.S., I'll use a U.S. analogy, that uh, uh, similar to a bipartisan con congressional caucus, where these politicians and other uh, high-level advocates uh, they've made a commitment to the alliance, and next time there's a policy issue in each of these six regions, they will commit and help, help move the agenda of the alliance forward. Um, and these are some of the board structure. Um, the accomplishments to date, the alliance, the alliance uh, started off with 20 organizations in December, is now up to 47. Um, there's another 10 MOAs out for signature. The alliance has accomplished the first ever meetings at the UN, um, major international venues, including the Glo Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, the first ever U.S. congressional briefing with one of our partners uh, was critical in including surgical indicators in the WHO's 100 core indicator list. For the resolution that, that uh, just passed um, in May, 
the Alliance and with its member organizations, but the Alliance full-time staff um, contacted 150 countries in support of the resolution and did in-person briefings for over 50 countries, uh, which is pretty amazing. And this was spearheaded by the chair of the Honorary Council, Ambassador Neil Parson. So we have particular thankfulness for him that he used his government uh, office and contacts to help us do that. Uh, and really it's the organization that's proposing a G4 Global Action Plan to strengthen in, um, both internationally as well as nationally surgical obstetric trauma and anesthesia capacity to help implement the WHA resolution that passed. Um, five framework elements at the, at the May board meeting were decided upon by these 47 organizations that we want to work together over the next six to 12 months. These were the criteria we used. Basically, we didn't want to overlap with organizations what individual organizations were doing. The alliance as a, as a combined entity should not do that. And what are the five um, framework elements? One is key messages. So this, may, this is important to make sure that even as individual organizations, uh, when we talk about surgery as part of, for example, universal health coverage, that that message resonates and is the same when you're hearing it from a, whether it's a Canadian organization or the West African College of Surgeons. Country level goals, targets, and metrics, I think that is important in terms of helping to encourage governments to set up surgical, national surgical plans, and then essentially holding them uh, accountable. And we're going through a process over the next six to 12 months uh, to make sure that um, uh, this, those can be finalized from the G4 Alliance perspective. Much of the heavy lifting has already been done by the Lancet Commission and DCP3, so that's really just an endorsement process. Guidelines and standards document really to define what the first referral facility level needs to provide, not just in terms of surgical procedures, but the type of expertise that might be there. A data platform uh, to help capture operative case data. Much of the data I'm showing you is based on modeling, but really, at, um, you know, many a case log uh, has, or a data system has fallen by the wayside because it was not focused on the end user. So the Alliance aims to, these organizations want to define a minimum data set in terms of what needs to be captured. And much of this work has already been done, so this is probably an endorsement process. And the fifth one is to build a data platform to track activities and partnerships. The Alliance really wants to tra train healthcare workers at an unprecedented scope and scale. For example, what's been discussed, although we've not publicly, this is not a public campaign until the organizations decide upon it, is for example, one million new trauma, a surgical obstetric trauma and anesthesia healthcare providers campaign but what that's going to look like, how that's going to be executed by the member organizations, that's still sort of under discussion. And this kind of a data platform to track that would be an important component of that. So these are, so, again, some of the data for you to, uh, or details for you to look at later, uh, but I wanted to just include them. So how can you directly engage? Last slide or two, I, um, I want to address that question. Well, I'm going to, uh, you know, cite, uh, um, quote our moderator, the Honorable Keith Martin, um, as everybody knows, hopefully, that he was a member of parliament in Canada, and he says this <coughs> quite frequently, and it's always resonated with me, that the public drives the political. Although it's wonderful to have, for example, the G4 Alliance doing its work, we really have to raise public awareness in terms of the importance of surgical care. Part of that is through using media and to tell the stories of patients, and many organizations are doing that in a great way, and the Alliance also aims to do that. There's also the social media campaign, the WeRG4 Surgery hashtag, the WeRG4 Anesthesia, et cetera. You can support the Alliance, of course. Uh, half the Alliance funding comes through member organizations, but half of it comes through private donors. So if you feel so inspired, continue to donate. We as board members don't make any money. It's only for the full-time staff, and they're very strict fiscal controls. Uh, talk to politicians, governments, policymakers, and get into the field. And get into the field and get hands-on experience, but think big. Don't get locked into that specific thing. And in terms of science, there's incredible need for uh, ongoing scientific expansion but, and think about implementation. Um, so in conclusion, I think surgical care and the surgical patient, uh, I hope you've learned something about that, that it's not just surgical procedures. Uh, the global surgery de deficit, staggering, um, but think about a systems-based approach. You've heard about the Alliance and what the framework elements the Alliance is thinking about. So there's a lot of work to do, and thank you so much, Keith, for the opportunity.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Baizan, for your excellent uh, presentation and giving an outline of what a colossal challenge this is and the human cost to the people who don't have access to basic surgical care that we enjoy. The cost is really uh, beyond almost comprehension unless you've seen it uh, yourself. And also letting people know that anybody on this call or their, their friends and their colleagues and their networks to support the G4 Alliance and other initiatives to be able to draw public and political attention to moving this ball forward. Because if we don't, uh, this will not be able to have the attention that it ought to. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Gurma Tefera. Dr. Tefera uh, is a professor of surgery in the Department of Surgery at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is also the new medical director of Operation Giving Back at the American College of Surgeons. This is a comprehensive resource to help surgeons find volunteer opportunities worldwide that match their experience and interest. And uh, Dr. Tefera, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and I hope uh, you guys can hear me well. Um, thank you for this kind introduction, and uh, I also want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to come and, uh, and talk at this forum, which uh, I think is superb, uh, to get out the word about the deficit of the global surgical field. Um, I really uh, want to also thank uh, Dr. Abdullah for sharing his slides ahead of time so that I don't duplicate much, much of the information so that we can really have a seamless presentation here. Although some numbers I think we have to uh, say uh, a couple of times and I just want also to congratulate him on the amount of work uh, both him and his organization have done in few months to really get the G4 online to where it is right now. Uh, that said, I think uh, it is uh, definitely an organization that uh, will add, contribute, and I think we should all look forward to working together. Um, that said, I, I just believe that we all uh, you know, live, of course, in this global world, in this global economy, but, uh, but uh, we have also seen uh, the health uh, globalization from all the communicable diseases that uh, get around us within a few hours. So I think uh, the healthcare component of uh, 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 the industry is probably lagging behind, but but I think we are getting there. And uh, in, in, in the past uh, several decades, uh, there has been a lot of investment in improving healthcare in the developing world and uh, in the low and middle income countries, um, with a lot of resources being invested. And I think uh, we are making progress, and I am really optimistic that uh, uh, a lot more attention is also given to surgery, so moving forward, we can probably uh, decrease the gap. I don't have much of a disclosure in, uh, in uh, today's presentation, but I just want to tell you a few things about myself, and, uh, and my disclosure probably is that I work for American College of Surgeons. Um, uh, uh, that, however, uh, my global health experience and work has been um, uh, for the past many, many years. And, uh, and I, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself because uh, at some point we talk about what we call um, the um, um, brain drain and maybe I fit in that and I probably am contributing to the problem of the healthcare or surgical workforce gap. I grew up in Ethiopia, I did my um, uh, secondary education there and subsequently went to Europe for um, uh, my medical school and during this um, uh, you know medical school time I was able to of course go back and do uh, and contribute to the Ethiopian um, um, healthcare workforce uh, but subsequently um, I finished went and worked for five years uh, and when it came to getting a specialization done, um, we didn't have enough resources and enough capacity and I needed to go out again. And uh, that was when I went to Europe again for my surgical training and things changed uh, significantly. A lot of instability, 
uh, both uh, from safety perspective and others, that really led to my migrating to the U.S. Uh, somewhere around 20 something years ago, and uh, I live here since then. My uh, my re-engagement in global health actually came from two uh, occasions that uh, uh, started early on in my career. Number one was uh, one of my mentors actually after retirement moved to Ethiopia and when he came back to visit um, asked me when am I going to go and do something about people back there needing help. And then subsequently a few days later a patient of mine gave me this book which you see on the slide which says you know from success to significance and kind of challenged me by you know by reminding me that you know you are successful now you have become the big shot doctor and specialist and you're doing vascular surgery what are you doing to make some significance elsewhere in the low and middle income countries and it really resonated a lot with me and and since then I've been totally um, involved in in this uh, in this uh, arena and this um, uh, activities so in my presentation, I have a few words about um, the global surgical deficit uh, and in the surgical deficit uh, conversation that happened about 35 years ago. This is a note from uh, Dr. Mahler, who was the Director General of the World Health Organization, then addressing the uh, World uh, Congress of International College of Surgeons. And he said at that time, yet the vast majority of the world's population has no access whatsoever to skilled surgical care and little is being done to find a solution. And it's interesting that he could really give this presentation even now and uh, we might, you know, we have almost, you know, similar kind of uh, catastrophic conditions. A couple of weeks ago I was sitting in a room in a meeting trying to work with some of my African colleagues actually regarding this manpower and specifically training issues and the presentation started by one of my African colleagues with this picture of a crater. And he was trying to really send a message and say, we are, our deficit, he was saying, is really uh, so deep. And uh, we are so deep down that to get out of this, he said, we need to start acting now. And we need to start uh, having help from uh, everybody around us. Um, Back in 2013, there was uh, a, a report that came out on, under this motto, No Health Without a Workforce, and uh, this was really developed by the Global Health Workforce Alliance, and they really, uh, you know, gave us all the numbers we needed, uh, whereby at the present stage, 7.2 million healthcare workers are needed. Of this, 42 million are lacking, actually, in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, which basically constitutes 60 percent of the population having more than 50 percent of the, the shortage. And the Lancet Commission, as uh, Dr. Abdullah mentioned, have really come out with an amazing amount of data for us to work from and uh, specifically put in that information saying, well, we have really 5 billion people out there who have no access to safe uh, surgery. So that said, drilling down to you know how much surgeons are uh, are we lacking is um, is uh, a kind of a little bit of a challenging task. However, there are some numbers you know for the audience's um, uh, perspective where the high income countries have anywhere around uh, 57 surgeons per 100,000 population. In the low income countries, it's uh, uh, less than one per 100,000. So this really gives you the idea and the gap where the uh, burden on one side is not matching with the uh, need for the workforce. That said, you know, pictures always tell a lot more story and, and I know these numbers have been mentioned and I'm not going to repeat them, but really the injury-related issues and maternal death-related issues as well as the child uh, congenital anomalies related problems and the burden that is coming upon us from cancer and uh, of this 40 million new cases of cancer that are going to be diagnosed you know knowing that 60 percent are going to be probably in Africa really um, has to make us work a little bit faster and a little bit harder 
And here are three pictures which I took when I went for an external examiner in Ethiopia. And you see on one side this huge neck mass on a 54-year-old gentleman who is a farmer with a, a family of seven. And imagine what his loss is going to be for that family. And in the middle is a picture of a 19-year-old a uh, uh, guy who has this bladder extrophy for 19 years. Uh, something would have really taken care of it here, uh, you know, uh, early on. And on on the other corner, you see this huge thigh sarcoma in a 22-year-old who is a, a college student. I mean, these pictures really show you uh, the severe, severe lack of, you know, health. Um, when it comes to surgical care, and and uh, and I'm sure it resonates with most of you. I just wanted to put up this slide because I think it's important to also look at what is going on here at home, uh, because uh, because unless we also put that in perspective, uh, that the issue uh, is really global, uh, maybe maybe lost in in the context. So this is uh, uh, a data that was published in 2006 from uh, the American College of Surgeons Health Policy Research Institute. And what it showed was in the US, 30% of US counties lack a surgeon. It's not like they don't have hospitals. Actually, 50% of uh, these counties have a hospital, but they do not have a surgeon. And, uh, and in these counties, you know, close to 10 million people live. And when you go down to um, figuring out how many surgeries happen in those counties, it's less than a third of what it would have happened if there was a surgeon. So the disparities in the U.S. from access to surgery themselves itself is becoming really a major, a major issue. That said, um, the inner cities are also part of the surgical deserts uh, because we have so many people who have no access right here in our backyards. That said, I think uh, Dr. L.D. Britt, uh, who is a past president of the American College of Surgeons, has really uh, said it uh, eloquently by saying, no access, no quality, even here in our backyards. And this has been the emphasis, actually, to move forward in getting an NIH and the ACS symposium on surgical disparity research so that we can really drill down, understand the magnitude of the problem, where is the problem, and what kind of a problem is it so that it can be tackled uh, by, by all of us. So what I try to really frame here is the question of uh, that the surgical workforce issue is really not a third world issue. It's really a global issue. And when we, we, when we look further into the U.S. situation, you know, we rely uh, for over 25% of our workforce from international graduates. And, uh, you know, despite the global code of uh, practice that's uh, uh, outlined by the WHO, migration of workforce from um, less developed uh, countries to the states is uh, actually happening in a staggering amount. Um, that said, our workforce is also aging, and uh, almost one third of our our physicians are greater than 55 years old. So, and our population is aging and is increasing. So, this crisis is really a, a global crisis, and and it would be a mistake if we think it's really limited to the third world. And and that's an important perspective to put because then we need to look for solutions together. That's what it means. You know, briefly about the American College of Surgeons. Uh, this is uh, over a hundred uh, years old organization that um, has really, uh, as a centerpiece of its mission statement, uh, dedicated uh, itself for improving the care of the surgical patient. And, um, and uh, to safeguard basically the standard of care and in, in an optimal and ethical uh, practical environment. This uh, college has been a center for innovation in surgical practice. Uh, it has really significantly improved and assisted in the quality improvement of surgical patients to be, to be the national leader. Um, the American College of Surgeons is known for conducting research, uh, promoting the image of the surgical profession, and 
nurturing the uh, next generation of surgeons, so educating the next generation of surgeons and, and students. So these pillars, which I show in this uh, brief uh, image, basically show where the strength of the college is and where the college has really uh, done so much work to strengthen the surgical care uh, in the United States and in Canada. This is really a list uh, of timeline of major achievements, which uh, we can come in just for the sake of time. I would uh, probably not go into it now. Uh, but what I just wanted to show you with this slide here is that the college is uh, basically home to over 80,000 surgeons. And they are all over the world. And, uh, and uh, it is a global organization. Um, what is really important also here to note is that the African continent, which is in terms of size and population, you know, the United States plus many other, plus Europe and, uh, and, and area-wise may add even India, uh, has the least number of, um, of fellows of the American College of Surgeons, which reflects actually the gap, the deficit in the surgical workforce. And, and so I think we see this definitely as a challenge, but it's also an opportunity to do something about that. This slide is uh, to show you some of the global surgical engagements that the college has been doing for the past 50 plus years or more. Uh, and the Operation Giving Back, the program I serve as a director, is uh, something that was established back in 2004. And uh, this was established from, by the mandate from the Board of Governors uh, at that time led by uh, Professor Andrew Washa uh, and subsequently as a medical director Kathleen Casey led the, the program for about 10 years and really got it to be well recognized among the surgical uh, specialties in the global surgical world. The mission of the Operation Giving Back, as uh, uh, Dr. Martin earlier mentioned a little bit, is really to leverage on the passion and skills and the humanitarian ethos of the surgical community to effectively meet their, uh, their, uh, their needs so that they can serve the medically underserved both here uh, as well as internationally. And uh, the, uh, the um, photos you see below is where we actually take time to honor some of our awardees on a yearly basis at uh, our clinical congress. And uh, there is actually, this is, uh, it's in its uh, 14th year now, and uh, we have awardees both humanitarians who have devoted their entire life versus volunteers who are doing a significant part of their you know, surgical life. And, uh, and uh, there is also a special award for domestic uh, contributions, uh, as well as for residents and, uh, and the military. So the award component of uh, recognition component of our work is really uh, a very important and dear part of what Operation Giving Back promotes. That said, uh, the overall work has been connecting volunteers to organizations. It has been supporting volunteers with web-based resource center that is very robust, uh, facilitating educational programs for humanitarian missions, and, uh, and advocacy for the underserved uh, surgical patient, both here locally as well as uh, globally. So just uh, looking at the way forward, I really do think um, it's important that uh, we develop partnerships that uh, can uh, really be uh, based on shared goals and mutual benefits. I really think we need to look into uh, our own benefits as well in reaching out to the world. Uh, we need to involve our communities of volunteers uh, and partners. Uh, we have to really have uh, a broader institutional relationships, uh, although the peer-to-peer -peer relationships and collaborations are the foundations, but the broader institutional relationships are really the way to keep things in a sustainable manner. We really appreciate and understand that there is really no prescriptive way of doing processes, but I think if uh, at some point um, a, um, a shared goal is outlined and uh, 
and parties come together to really work together, um, that shared goal can be really the target where we all want to get to. And we have uh, a lot of targets to pick from. And, and one of the most important ones is, of course, that we are all passionate about is our underserved surgical patients. I have this slide to show uh, in one of the surveys uh, I did, you know, we did uh, about uh, a year and a half or so ago uh, of our volunteers. Uh, you can see how almost um, almost 90% uh, uh, of the survey do respond that they have had a positive impact in their personal life, and almost 75% have some kind of a positive impact on their professional life. So I think these are kind of the benefits which we need to look into and at some point uh, quantify them so that when we create relationships and are going to go out there in the world and try to support and help, we need to also put on the table what we get out of them because then our relationships and partnerships will be stronger. I really want to call for joining hands uh, and I, I really do believe that the works that have been done so far in the global health arena in different silos have not been moving the needle far as far as we could and, uh, and I really hope um, that organizations who are not only working in the surgical arena but also uh, others uh, who are in the health field should really find ways to come together so that we can achieve a greater good. I just wanted to put this, uh, um, uh, two more slides, this uh, one of the last slides to show that I think from workforce development point of view, um, education is one of the strengths we have. I really think from quality care point of view, we need data and that's how in American surgery we have achieved the quality we have gotten to and uh, we have basically people uh, with knowledge and ability to do this. Um, cancer care is um, going to be one of the major burdens of surg surgical uh, issues in the world and uh, uh, we have to look into what can we learn from our cancer programs. Uh, unless we develop the global surgery leaders, uh, sustainability is going to be a problem and uh, we uh, always boast that surgeons are leaders by nature. However, uh, in, you know, as you all know, in the U.S., American College has done so much to really develop surgeons as leaders. And uh, in trauma, as well as advocacy for the um, surgically underserved and making sure surgery remains an integral part of the universal health coverage re requires everybody's effort. And, uh, and going into the next um, sustainable development uh, era, uh, thinking about injuries and trauma uh, is something that we cannot ignore because people die 90% of the time on the roads in the low and middle income countries. And uh, we have programs which we should share with the rest of the world. So my, my hope and, um, and uh, one of the additional circles I would like to put in this timelines at some point is really, you know, amplifying and, and, and getting that global engagement uh, in such a way uh, that can touch everyone and that uh, can really become uh, the center of uh, what we do, what we do best. And that said, to do this, we definitely uh, have an urgent need to develop coalitions around our surgical patient that is anchored in the spirit of partnerships. And we have enough infrastructure, uh, including what we have infrastructure-wise from uh, Operation Giving Back, that we can use uh, to further our mission together. I really appreciate this opportunity uh, that uh, CUGH has given me to present and I am really looking forward to connect with many more of you guys out there in the global surgery arena and I have my email address as well as our Operation Giving Back contact us address and, and thank you again for uh, this wonderful opportunity. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tafir, for a wonderful presentation on showing 
the human resources deficit that exists not only with physicians, surgeons, but also nurses, technologists, pathologists, and the whole array of individuals involved in enabling people to have access to surgical care. We have about uh, 12 minutes for questions. I'll get to them right now. I'll ask you please be uh, brief with your uh, comments and we'll try to bundle them together. Uh, the first question comes from R.V. Blystone who asks, what are the five surgical procedures that offer the biggest bang for the buck in the global health arena? And by then I'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Keith, for that. and I thank uh, the questioner for that question. Um, this is actually a very uh, controversial subject because um, uh, naturally if you look, people have done studies in terms of where the burden of surgical disease is and naturally there's different ways to look at it in terms of uh, you know, disability adjusted life years, etc. But the long and short of it is that uh, having a list of surgical procedures is an approach that uh, some have promoted in terms of having whether not just five, but people have talked about 10 or 15 or 25. The DCP3, uh, they came up with 44 procedures that would be essential. Um, I think that's uh, an important component when you define that as specific levels of the, the health system, there should be specific procedural capacities. But we should be very careful about the trap of just saying that, that five procedures or 15 or 44 procedures is going to solve the problem of, of the global surgery deficit. It's a, we have really have to think about it from a health systems perspective in terms of not just which procedures, but who is you know, providing those procedures, how we're going to monitor quality, what are the resources that are ne needed to provide those procedures safely, what are the entire, there's a whole layer of anesthesia overlay that's necessary for providing procedures, et cetera. So um, again, thank you for that question. Thank you, Varzan. Gurma, I'll ask you this question. It's really a, a bundle of a couple of questions from Joshua Carlson and Zineb uh, Bantunsi are both medical students. Uh, Zineb asks uh, how uh, a medical student can get involved in dealing with the global surgery deficit. And Joshua Carlson has started a, um, uh, an NGO on uh, medical students in global surgery uh, is asking um, how, do we, how do you go about identifying the needs in countries in terms of uh, the type of surgical care that they require? So two questions are bundled into that. Yeah, so, yeah, so thank you for that quest, those uh, two questions. Um, in terms of how can uh, medical students be involved, I think, um, again, uh, through the operation giving back, as I have shown uh, the uh, email um, address, uh, you, they can contact us. But that said, um, we are in the development of um, uh, uh, clinical congress uh, programs uh, that uh, will address um, educational uh, activities geared towards preparing um, students, residents, and the surgical volunteers of all different levels. Uh, to really better engage in their global uh, health arena. I, I do think the, um, the question of uh, students versus, and residents versus the surgeons um, in, in this engagement becomes uh, two-tiered because the students and the residents are learners and uh, the, um, the surgeons, uh, yes, do learn. However, they can provide service and teaching. And so I really think uh, everything has to be seen in that context. And, uh, and uh, in uh, some of the programs we want to, um, or actually have started developing, uh, will be contextualized in what we will call a pre-deployment uh, kind of training. And uh, we need a lot more of that because then it will facilitate and it will make sure um, students and residents and junior faculty will really ask the questions, not only why am I going there, but what am I going to learn question as well, and how can I be useful kind of question as well. So, so that is in the works. Uh, in terms of the needs from, uh, from the different um, uh, countries and places uh, where we work, uh, you know, it is very hard to say at this point uh, uh, 
the needs are vast. Uh, they the needs are both from infrastructure to educational materials to um, capital equipment to teachers, and you know basically there is a need for for uh, almost everything you can imagine. Uh, however, I think it has to be in a very uh, organized, programmatic way um, that you have to go by in addressing those issues, and, and therefore I don't think they should be seen in an, in an isolation. Thank you very much, Gurma. Uh, Faizan, this question comes from Janet D1. She's asking a, a legal question. She's essentially asking uh, whether or not anybody has targeted a lack of access to basic surgical care as an obligation under the right to health as a matter of international and domestic legal accountability. And I'd also just say to both Joshua and Zaneb here at CUGH, if you go on our website, cugh.org, we have a student group, we have a global surgery uh, interest group. I encourage you to go online and check it out. So, Faisan, uh, has uh, anyone targeted a lack of basic surgical uh, care as an obligation under a right to health? as a matter of international law? Uh, I, I can answer what I know. I don't believe that that's the case, that, that, that there has not been ever, ever such language uh, that specifically targets surgical care. Uh, and um, our executive, our just immediate past executive director, Jamie Henry, would probably be the best person um, to answer that question. But I do not believe um, that we have any language currently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Faisan. Um, it's a question uh, from uh, Halima Munir. Halima is uh, 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 contacting from IFMSA Pakistan, uh, working on global surgery at a national level. And they were wondering uh, if there is any country-wide list of partners of the G4 Alliance available for them to review in Pakistan or whether there's a general countrywide list of organizations committed to working for global surgery in different countries. So how would um, surgeons, medical students, residents, and different countries around the world get engaged with uh, G4 Alliance members? I want to thank uh, you for that question. Uh, there is a one organization that from Pakistan that comes to mind immediately uh, is uh, Indus Hospital, which is a member of the Alliance. The Alliance is really, um, just like Gurma mentioned, the American College of Surgeons um, is 100 years old. The Alliance is relatively early in its growth. It just officially launched uh, literally almost 100 days ago uh, uh, in May. So the Alliance is recruiting new organizations. And so Indus Hospital, uh, Dr. Lubna Samad is the permanent council member from um, in this hospital, but there's many others that are in active discussions. You can go to the website, the g4alliance.org, and see the list of organizations that have already signed up for the G4 Alliance, as well as the permanent council members who are there. You can certainly contact them. They would be great focal points in terms of getting involved with the Alliance. Also, look, there's going to be six global regional launch events that are coming up uh, all over the world. That's where they're global events, so you can look to participate um, to, in those. Uh, there will also be some global webinars. This coming Monday, July 27th, is the first global webinar uh, for uh, that's going to discuss the consultative process around the G4 Global Action Plan. So please sign up, participate in that. So hopefully those opportunities would uh, will you know are something that you can participate in. As medical students, you guys are the future. So we really need you to engage and tell us what we're doing wrong, us middle and and elder, older age groups. So thank you for your question. Thanks, Fazan. And, and also, you uh, both discussed the, the different skill sets that are required. We really want nurses involved in this too, uh, as well as many other skill sets that are involved, anesthesiologists, nurses, um, uh, the rest of the ecosystem of people involved in power access, water access, uh, that enables uh, uh, medical uh, healthcare workers to do their job and provide care. The next question comes from uh, Dr. Helen DePino at Columbia University, who's done and has been doing outstanding work uh, there in public health. And Dr. DePino asks uh, uh, the question uh, she poses is, how much uh, of the G4 is prepared, the G4 prepared to get behind advocating for associate clinicians that are providing more than 90% of cesarean sections in Tanzania, Malawi, and Mozambique at a district level? 
So Dr. DePino was wondering how can we engage and are we engaging non-surgeons, non-physicians to provide surgical care? I can ask uh, then that's uh, going to you. Derma, you may want to also uh, uh, talk about this from off giving back perspective. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for that question, and I think it's a really timely question because uh, there's no question about it that um, non-surgeon physicians are going to play a critical role uh, in terms of strengthening sur surgical services globally. And in fact, um, as Keith alluded to, the, ma the majority of surgical care right now is actually provided by, s by nurses. Uh, it's not provided by surgeons um, or you know, even healthcare uh, physicians. Um, so in terms of non-surgeon physicians and their role, I think my experience with the Alliance as well as with WHO before that is really WHO and sort of international agencies, their role is to provide resources and then the decisions about who's going to provide care is really a local decision. Um, I can refer back to one of the contexts where uh, with, through the Bloomberg philanthropies we did a study in West Africa and Ghana and we took the chairs of surgery. Uh, from Korlebu Teaching Hospital in Konfanochi, and we went out to some of the out, all 10 regions of Ghana and looked at who was providing surgical care at district hospital levels, it was really then that conversation and that recognition that much of the care was being provided already by non-surgeon physicians that propels the discussion locally in terms of what sort of future plans and decisions should be made. So I don't think that's really for the Alliance to decide that uh, you know, we're going to promote, for example, task shifting per se, although definitely to provide resources and to make sure that it's accessible and and we can facilitate those countries that want to do task shifting, absolutely. The Alliance views that as part of its wheelhouse, but it does not have a specific agenda to, for example, promote uh, you know, task shifting in all countries and in all contexts. That, of course, wouldn't make sense. Well, I have to, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I have to actually run out of time. And uh, I just really want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Tafera, uh, Dr. Abdullah. You've both done a great job of uh, outlining the, uh, the, the neglected global challenge. I think the strong message is uh, all of you can get involved in this. Tell your, tell your colleagues, tell your networks to get involved. Here at the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, we have created uh, a global surgery uh, interest group. Uh, you can participate in, in that if, if you're a member. Uh, and you can join if you're an institution by going on our website at cugh.org, no matter where you are in the world. Join our network of 135 universities around the world. Plus, we have a network of 11,000 individuals. And if you're an individual, uh, you can join CUGH2 by again going on our website at cugh.org. Thank you very much uh, for joining us in our webinar series, this one on global surgery. We look forward to seeing you next time. I'd like to thank uh, Karen Lam and also Jalal Najjar here in the office uh, uh, in Washington who do all the hard work on these webinars and Amy Kasman too. So thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time at our next Global Health Webinar. <laughs>